thank you, thank you guys. Uh, so today talk will be about uh, Ethereum smart contract hacking. Uh, most of you uh, probably know me, but uh, for those of you who don't, uh, I am the developer of the Zombie Browser Toolkit. Uh, I wrote a uh, hardware firewall bypass uh, toolkit for uh, Windows systems. I'm also the developer of the Malware Analysis Sandbox Tester tool. I played with some crappy IoT devices and uh, my uh, RC exploit code uh, ended up in a botnet. And uh, last but not least, uh, I invented the idea of encrypted exploit delivery, which uh, later was implemented uh, by some of the exploit key developers. All right, uh, so now let's uh, start uh, with uh, why am I talking uh, about Ethereum uh, smart contract security and uh, blockchain itself? Who am I to talk about this topic? According uh, to the biggest uh, professional network uh, in the world, I am a blockchain expert already, so there is that. Uh, but before uh, starting uh, the presentation, I have a few questions uh, to you guys. Uh, first of all, hands up if you know something about blockchain. Alright, almost everyone. Uh, hands up if you ever try to explain Bitcoin to your parents, colleagues, kids. Alright, I think... Okay, uh, so hands up if you ever interacted with a smart contract. No one. No one ever interacted with a smart contract. Okay, one, one. We have one guy. Alright, cool. Uh, so, first of all, uh, just some attention uh, about uh, my presentation. Everything is oversimplified in this presentation and uh, it has not uh, much uh, to do with reality. Uh, and uh, this is mostly about understanding the big picture, how smart contracts work. It is not about uh, being uh, very uh, deeply technical or uh, these kind of things. Uh, I will also never give you investment tips and in any case you believe that this presentation wants to convince you to sell, buy or hodl, you are wrong because I would never do that. The only investment tip when it comes to cryptocurrencies is that uh, only play with money you can afford to lose tomorrow. Alright, uh, so as promised I will be very quick in these uh, first slides because uh, most of you are familiar with cryptocurrencies. Uh, so let's go with metaphors and let's say math is hard. Uh, I know for me math is hard so that is true. And let's say that we form a group uh, where we solve math challenges and we call this process mining. All right. So, and the uh, math challenges uh, are, uh, have some special properties because although it is hard uh, to solve a math challenge, but whenever there is a solution, it is very easy to check uh, whether the solution is correct or not. So basically everyone can uh, check uh, whether the solution is correct or not. And uh, Whoever is the first solving the math challenge, uh, he can receive monies. Uh, in this presentation, monies is my imaginary cryptocurrency. Uh, now that you have uh, some monies after you solved some of the math challenges, uh, maybe you can you want to transfer uh, these uh, monies uh, to Piggy, for example, and uh, everyone will know about this transaction and basically everyone has to know about all the details of the transaction, right? And it is basically public knowledge that, uh, for example, Bunny sent some uh, monies to Piggy. Uh, and uh, if we uh, process and collect together all uh, the transactions and so we collect all the not yet processed transactions together uh, and we bundle 
these transactions and we include these transactions as additional parts to the math challenge we call this bundle a block and uh, whenever someone wants to include his uh, transaction in this block that someone has to pay a so-called transaction fee and basically a blockchain is a very long paper trail uh, which is uh, created uh, by every blocks where every block uh, is uh, referencing uh, to the previous one or the next one all right so i'm sure that uh, based on all the knowledge uh, i uh, passed to you you already know a lot more about blockchain than uh, most CEOs or uh, other people who invest in cryptocurrencies. So you are already very lucky about that. All right, so what, uh, how can newcomers get some monies? Uh, uh, first of all, as I already mentioned, they can start to solve some new math challenges but uh, before they can do that uh, they have to get the full copy of the long paper trail or how we call it the blockchain and uh, also not just by solving the math challenges you get uh, some monies but also including the transactions uh, you can get monies because there is the transaction fee as well or if you don't want to solve math challenges, you can ask someone else to send you some monies. Uh, for example, uh, you can exchange it for real money or alpaca socks or whatever. Now, you want to hold uh, your monies somewhere, right? And uh, that uh, place that uh, something is called wallet. And uh, whenever you send monies uh, from your wallet uh, to someone else's wallet, you basically sign a transaction uh, with a digital signature, which is impossible to counterfeit. And uh, what's very interesting in the blockchain world that these transactions are most of the times irreversible and final. And as already mentioned, everyone will know that you transfer the money and you cannot draw back. So why is this whole blockchain thingy so interesting? First of all, you don't have to be in the same room to do these math challenges. And you can do all this stuff through the internet. And you don't even have to know who the others are. Uh, and this is uh, something called pseudo anonymity. All right, now uh, I really do hope that uh, everyone in the audience like uh, Dilbert, because uh, I do love, so there will be some uh, other Dilbert comics as well. And uh, now you, I am sure that you already know a lot more now about Bitcoin and blockchains than the pointy hair boss. Uh, let me ask you the question. Have you tried to 3D print a blockchain and HTML it into a Bitcoin? Guys, hands up if you try this. No? Yes? No? Okay. Maybe this was a bad joke. Alright, so I think the best uh, explanation when it comes to cryptocurrencies uh, came from Johnny Oliver when he told that uh, cryptocurrencies are basically everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. Uh, good thing about Camp++ is that at least you guys know how computers work, but uh, I have to admit I have no idea how money works. So there is that. I still don't understand uh, most of the things uh, in the cryptocurrency world. All right, so now let's have a deep dive into smart contracts. Uh, not many people know, but uh, Bitcoin is also capable of doing smart contracts, but uh, we will talk uh, about Ethereum because Ethereum was designed for smart contracts, so it's a lot easier to do that when it comes to Ethereum. Uh, but 
What is a smart contract and uh, why were smart contracts invented? Now, uh, with uh, cryptocurrencies, you can transfer money without any trusted third party and that's just great, right? But uh, life is not just about uh, transferring money. Uh, life is uh, sometimes uh, about uh, signing contracts. And uh, even if you can transfer money uh, in the blockchain, uh, you want to sign some kind of contract and uh, if in this uh, distributed peer-to-peer -peer world, you don't want to involve any trusted third party in this, right? So for example, whenever you try to pay on Amazon or whatever with your Bitcoin, you are still using a trusted third party called Amazon, even if you use Bitcoin for payment. There are also some very interesting use cases where uh, smart contracts can be really, really good. For example, uh, if you want to do some crowdfunding without uh, a company like Kickstarter, because for example, you don't want to impose any rules how crowdfunding should work. Or um, it is also uh, very interesting when it comes to gambling sites. For example, nowadays uh, clients have uh, no idea uh, how they can trust uh, any gambling sites. Uh, but uh, if uh, the gambling sites is basically implemented in a smart contract, then uh, the whole story is totally different. Also, smart contracts uh, can solve the issue where you have to pay upfront to buy something but get delivered later. Uh, funny thing is that there is even a smart contract already existing today uh, which can finance the defacement of a website. Okay, uh, so how should you imagine a smart contract? Uh, for example, let's say you want to buy a Diet Coke from a vending machine and you give one dollar to the vending machine, press a button and you will get your Diet Coke, right? But what if the, if the vending machine doesn't look to be trusted? What if you have to pay $1,000 to get 1,000 Diet Cokes? What if the vending machine is 1,000 miles away? In these cases, you really need a trusted third party uh, so you can be sure that uh, your contract between the vending machine and you uh, will be executed, right? So, and in this case, for example, you have to order the Coke from Amazon, which will be the trusted third party. So when it comes to smart contracts, uh, basically you want to sign and get a countersign of a contract. And uh, you basically want to carve this contract into a stone which cannot be modified, right? And in this smart contract world, the stone is the blockchain. And the blockchain is basically powered by all the time and the energy spent on solving math challenges. Okay, so what language will we use uh, for these smart contracts? Um, in the real world, for example, when it comes to international contracts, these international contracts are pretty hard because of the language. Which language do you use? Usually uh, it's, for example, English, but uh, there can be a translation uh, for the same contract. But uh, in the translated version, uh, there will be a part which states that if there is a difference between the original English uh, contract and the translation, then the original English contract uh, is uh, the valid one. So translating um, contracts is not very, how could I say, useful at all. And what's really good about smart contracts is that they are based on code and code is universal. Uh, so if you have a code and you embed this code into the blockchain, 
it cannot be disputed because it's already there and carved there and uh, it can be only interpreted in one way okay so let's quickly talk about gas uh, what it is uh, a smart contract is basically a code uh, which will be executed by anyone who solves the math challenges for the monies or as we already said who mines the cryptocurrencies and similarly to transaction fees uh, you have to pay some uh, monies whenever you want your smart contract code executed by everyone. And uh, the more complex your smart contract code is, the more monies you have to pay. And uh, this monies is called gas in Ethereum, which you have to pay uh, whenever you want to... Uh, execute a smart contract okay all right so uh, i promise we will soon get there and uh, just wait uh, we will talk about uh, smart contract hacking very soon but first uh, let's discuss the ethereum virtual machine uh, in order to discuss uh, the Ethereum virtual machine, uh, we have to talk a little bit about bytecode. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are a lot better explanations of what bytecode is, uh, but for now, uh, what you have to know is that bytecode, it is not a machine code, so you cannot directly execute the bytecode on your CPU, but you need a virtual machine to execute your bytecode. And uh, in the smart contract world, uh, Solidity is the number one language uh, to develop uh, smart contracts. And uh, first you write your smart contract in Solidity, and after that you have to compile this code into the Ethereum virtual machine bytecode, which will be executed on the Ethereum virtual machine. What's really cool about uh, these smart contracts is that uh, you can always publish your source code, which means everyone can uh, have a look at the smart contract source code. And uh, what's also again very nice that the Solidity source code compiles into the same bytecode in a reproducible way, at least uh, if the same parameters and uh, same compiler versions are used. Which means that if you publish uh, your source code uh, for your smart contract and uh, you uh, link uh, your source code uh, to your uh, smart contract address, everyone can check uh, that uh, yes, uh, this is the smart code, the smart contract source code I want to interact with and uh, this is the bytecode uh, which is already uh, in the blockchain and you can compile uh, the source code at home and check whether the same bytecode is in the blockchain and this is very nice because this is how you can create trust around smart contracts what's really funny about uh, the uh, smart contracts and the Ethereum virtual machine uh, is that uh, AVM is executing the bytecode on every node. Uh, by every node I mean the mining nodes and the validating nodes. Uh, which is probably not very effective when it comes to scalability, but uh, the integrity of the transactions are pretty good. Uh, it's also important to say that uh, the Ethereum virtual machine is Turing complete as it is with most of the programming languages and again I know that Turing completeness can be explained a lot better but for me Turing completeness means that uh, it is a machine which has some RAM and ROM it can calculate, has go to, if then else, arrays so you have everything that you need uh, for a proper programming language. 
Uh, you also have to know that uh, it's not just uh, valids uh, which can hold Ether in the blockchain, but also smart contracts. This will be very important later on. And the Ether is the thing you mind when you were solving the math challenges in the Ethereum world. All right, uh, so let's uh, talk a very little bit about JavaScript developers, because it is also very important. Uh, Solidity, the main smart contract language, looks very similar to JavaScript. And uh, also in almost all cases, uh, there is a JavaScript-based front-end uh, uh, for the smart contract, uh, which can be used uh, to interact with the smart contract itself. So this means that many, many smart contract coders have JavaScript background. What's the issue with that? So because JavaScript uh, developers are working always on the front end, they have learned uh, that uh, they have to move fast and break things because this is how you develop the front end. Problem is that uh, whenever you want to develop Ethereum smart contracts, this approach is not very profitable uh, because uh, with the Solidity language and with the smart contracts itself, you deploy something once and after that you can be hacked anytime as long as the smart contract is in the blockchain. So move fast and break things. This really, really is not a good strategy when it comes to smart contracts. Uh, there are many, many hundreds or even thousands of uh, so-called distributed apps or smart contracts uh, in the world. Uh, here is a, a screenshot uh, from a website which lists the uh, mostly used uh, smart contracts. And uh, for this uh, presentation, I want to show you guys, uh, first of all, how MetaMask works. Uh, interacting uh, with a smart contract is usually uh, uh, that uh, you have a browser and this browser has uh, capability with interacting a smart contract. So it is either integrate, this capability is either integrated into your web browser or you install an extension uh, which has this capability. Uh, one of the most popular extensions to do that is MetaMask, which I can recommend. Uh, by far, this is the best what I have seen so far. So you basically install this extension into your browser, uh, you create a new wallet, uh, you open your wallet, and after that, uh, for example, if you want to register at a important smart contract website like CryptoKitties, then uh, the website will uh, know your wallet address and you can register on the website uh, with your wallet address by uh, signing a message uh, with your private keys. Okay, uh, so let's uh, quickly have a look at a demo how these uh, CryptoKitties smart contract works. Um, I am showing you guys uh, CryptoKitties because it is uh, one of the most popular smart contracts in the world. So I think it's very important to see how serious smart contracts are. So as you can see here, I already registered uh, to the CryptoKitties website and I want to buy this kitty because I need one. No idea why, but I really need this kitty. And when I clicked on I want to buy this, uh, I get uh, to this uh, page uh, which is uh, from MetaMask. Uh, sorry for the resolution, uh, but what you have to see here is that uh, I am basically transferring uh, some amount of Ethereum uh, from my wallet address uh, to the smart contract itself. Meanwhile, I'm paying some transaction fees and I'm paying uh, also a gas price uh, for this for buying this kitty. And what's 
very funny is that uh, I did this recording like three or four months ago and back then uh, Metamask didn't show me uh, what uh, message I am uh, sending to this smart contract. It only showed that data included 36 bytes. And this means whenever I click on submit, in this Metamask interface I have no idea what I'm paying for. I only know that I am interacting with this specific smart contract at this address, but I have no idea which function I'm calling and what parameters I am using for this call. Luckily this has been fixed. Uh, I will show you a new uh, slide after this presentation how it looks like now in the latest release. But uh, I think this um, really shows uh, how beta the whole Ethereum world is that uh, it only happened this month that they implemented that people can see what they are accepting or what kind of messages they are sending uh, to the smart contracts. Okay, so let's buy this kitty. Uh, now the transaction is sent to the Ethereum network and on the Etherscan website we can check our transaction and uh, it usually takes less than one minute uh, when uh, my transaction gets accepted. On the website it takes another one minute uh, to show when before uh, my kit is shown, but in the meanwhile we can check what else is uh, on the CryptoKitty website. For example, here you can see this uh, very nice uh, gold dragon cat which you can buy for 4000 uh, 440 Ethereum, which is a hell of a lot of money. I have no idea why would anyone buy this kitty, but you, you never know. And there it is. Uh, I got my kitty, and it is already in the Ethereum blockchain that this kitty is mine. And as long as I have the private keys to my wallet, no one can steal my kitty. Uh, what's fun uh, with the CryptoKitties site is that uh, you can uh, start to breed new kitties e either if you have two kitty or you can uh, basically uh, start uh, advertising your kitty to others. So let's do that uh, for a duration of two days. Uh, I'm uh, advertising my kitty for breeding and let's hope that we will have a match. You know, it's like Tinder, but for crypto kitties. Uh, again, uh, this is a transaction because I have to pay for the breeding. Uh, so again, I have to pay some ether to do that and uh, some transaction fees and also some gas price to execute code in the smart contract. Right, let's submit this and let's wait. Unfortunately, it turned out that CryptoKitties uh, doesn't really work as I expected. So at the end, uh, no one uh, was interested in uh, breeding with my CryptoKitty. So I just lost like $10 on this transaction, but whatever. Cool, uh, so this is the new interface, what you can uh, see uh, in the latest MetaMask uh, since this August, where you can see that uh, you are calling the bid function, and uh, you can also see the hex data, which is uh, sent uh, to this smart contract. Uh, the first part of this hex data is the identifier of the bit function, which is called the myth method ID, and it is basically of the hash uh, of the description of the function, and uh, it is truncated to the first byte. And uh, at the end of this very long string, you can see the ID of the 
kitty which I wanted to buy when I made this screenshot. So now at least you have uh, some idea of what you want to interact with. Alright, so at the beginning when I started uh, to talk about smart contracts, uh, I was talking about decentralizing Amazon and now I'm talking about CryptoKitties and I'm sure you are pretty much confused that what the hell is going on, this is not what I promised. And uh, turns out that theory and practice doesn't really go well together when it comes to the cryptocurrency world because smart contracts are awesome when everything is in the blockchain for example a smart contract is only about ethers or it is about some uh, so-called crypto collectibles uh, like these crypto kitties and uh, you don't have to interact with the real world but whenever you have to interact with, with the real world stuff gets pretty complicated already uh, I was really uh, looking for a popular uh, smart contract uh, which can uh, be pretty similar to how, uh, for example, Amazon works. And I found something which is uh, similar, but turns out it is not using Ethereum smart contracts, but something similar. For example, if you check the Open Bazaar uh, application, it is a uh, uh, distributed uh, Amazon basically where you can uh, list what you want to sell, others can comment, others can rate you and others can buy your stuff and this is totally peer-to-peer -to -peer and distributed. So this is nice. I have no idea why there is nothing popular uh, when it comes to the Ethereum word, maybe it is, and I just didn't find that. Okay, anyway, uh, let's move to the most important part of the presentation, which is hacking, because at the beginning I promised you some hacking, and so far there was no hacking. So, as we already discussed, smart contracts are code, and as it is the case with every code, code can be hacked. And uh, whenever there is a contract written in human language, it can mean multiple things and uh, it can be interpreted differently, right? What is cool about smart contracts is that because uh, they are written in code, it can be only interpreted one way. That's nice. But the issue is that the way the code will be interpreted in the Ethereum virtual machine might be not the code what the smart contract developer thought he is writing, right? So he thinks, oh, I'm writing this code which will do this thing, but no, the code will do something totally else. Uh, the first uh, and one of the most famous uh, Ethereum smart contract hacking uh, involves uh, something called the DAO. Uh, the DAO is an acronym for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. And uh, it, is, it was basically a smart contract uh, which is uh, basically implementing uh, very basic way how, for example, a company can work. So you can propose things and other people can vote on that stuff. And if there is enough vote, then the proposal will be executed. So this is how you should uh, imagine a, a decentralized autonomous organization. And uh, it was pretty big. Uh, in 2016 because uh, when it started it already raised uh, 130 million US dollars which is a hell of a lot of money. Uh, some months later uh, someone uh, pointed out that uh, there might be an issue in general with uh, smart contracts because uh, there might be an exploit how uh, smart contract uh, 
how the Ethereum uh, stored in the smart contract can be emptied out by a malicious attacker. So this was published on June 9th and three days later uh, the developers of the DAO uh, smart contract uh, uh, published a blog post where they say that all right, we understand uh, this vulnerability, but everyone can calm down uh, because the DAO smart contract is not vulnerable at all and no DAO funds are at risk, which is nice, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, some days later, uh, turned out the developers of uh, the DAO smart contract were not totally right because the smart contract was vulnerable and the attacker basically transferred 250 million worth of uh, eaters uh, from this smart contract and uh, the way he did this is uh, called the re-entrancy attack and uh, in the smart contract the split DAO function was vulnerable but what is this re-entrancy attack? So uh, let's say you go to the bank and you ask uh, the bank teller to give you $500. The bank teller checks your balance. Uh, he can see that uh, you have $500. Uh, so he gives you this $500. But uh, before he can finish this transaction, you can interrupt this bank teller and ask him, Hey, but before you finish that, uh, can you give me another $500? And uh, the bank teller will check at the display and it will still show the same amount of money uh, what you had at the beginning, that yes, you have more than $500, so he can give it to you. And while he's counting the money, you can again interrupt this bank teller. Hey, can you give me another $500? And so on and so on. So you basically interrupt uh, the bank teller uh, why he is giving your money. Uh, luckily, humans are usually not that stupid, so you cannot do that with a human, uh, at least I hope so. Uh, but uh, in the case of the smart contracts, smart contracts are not smart, they only do uh, what they have been told to. So if uh, the smart contract code allows itself to be interrupted before it uh, changes the balance on your account. In that case, uh, this hack is possible. Uh, so let's see uh, similar code, uh, how this uh, look like in um, Solidity code. Uh, it is important to see that the following code will be not the code which was implemented in the uh, DAO uh, smart contract, but uh, it will be something very similar. So first there is a withdraw balance function, which uh, you can use that to basically withdraw all uh, the ether which you already uh, has in that smart contract. Uh, so first, uh, the smart contract will check uh, how much money you have uh, in the smart contract and uh, after that uh, it will uh, call a function and it will basically notify uh, you about the withdrawal. But uh, what is uh, funny uh, regarding uh, this function call is uh, that this will be basically handled by uh, some code uh, which can be controlled by the attacker itself. So whenever the attacker is uh, start uh, starts to call the withdraw balance again uh, in this call, then he can uh, recursively uh, uh, call uh, the withdraw balance before. Uh, the fourth line is executed where the user balance is emptied. 
So just imagine uh, the execution flow like the first line, the second line, and the third line is executed. Uh, now the code is passed uh, to the attacker code because uh, the MSG sender call is uh, an external function call to an attacker control code. And that code will uh, call withdraw balance again, the first line, the second line, the third line, and on and on and on. And it can be basically done uh, as long as there is any money in the smart contract itself. And it's not your money, it's the money in the smart contract from everyone. So this is an insecure code. You should never implement uh, something like this whenever you start to code a smart contract. So uh, this was basically the early days uh, of Ethereum and uh, most people were not very happy about this, uh, what happened. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the Bitcoin uh, exchange rate went up while uh, Ethereum was losing. Uh, as this uh, comic suggests, but uh, yeah, this is basically what happened. A hell of a lot of money was lost. What was the solution uh, to this problem? Well, uh, the community voted and uh, they voted to rewrite the past and pretend that this hack never happened. Uh, so they implemented a hard fork which means that they have uh, created a new version uh, of uh, the Ethereum client application. And uh, this new version is basically ignoring the uh, attacker calls and it pretends that all the money is still in the DAO funds. But uh, because this was a fork, uh, this means that now two different uh, chains uh, live side by side and the original uh, Ethereum chain where the hack happened is called Ethereum Classic, which is uh, still working and some people are still using it. And uh, it turns out that uh, the attacker was able to cash out and he got away with his Ethereum Classics, uh, which was worth uh, like 67 million US dollars at the end. Uh, what was also interesting in this story that uh, there was a delay implemented in the smart contract itself so that uh, no one can withdraw the ethers, uh, but only after waiting for 31 day, 30, 34 days. Um, and uh, this is why uh, the community was able to react and do the hard fork. So uh, the attacker was only able to cash out the Ethereum Classics uh, on the Ethereum Classic uh, exchange rate and not on the Ethereum exchange rate. But still, this is a lot of money. And another uh, funny part of this story is that someone also shorted Ethereum just minutes before the hack started. I don't know who could have this been. And after some days, uh, the attacker published an open blog post uh, where he basically thanks uh, to the developers of the DAO uh, for this reward because uh, his understanding is that uh, what he did is uh, totally legit because this is what was implemented in the smart contract. So, and he just interacted with the smart contract in a totally legitimate way. So the way he got all this money was legitimate, which is uh, more or less true i'm not sure all right so let's uh, have a quick talk about uh, multi-signature wallets and uh, multi-signature uh, wallets are uh, special wallets where you need a signature from multiple parties uh, in, so before uh, you can uh, do any actions right 
so let's discuss uh, the hack which happened in 2017, July 20, which is called the Shared Vulnerable Library plus Rainit hack. In this case, uh, only 41 million uh, worth of US worth of ethers uh, were stolen, but uh, a lot more uh, was in danger. But the good guys uh, saw uh, that an ongoing attack is happening, so they started uh, to uh, basically hack all the vulnerable smart contracts before the attacker can hack those. They secured all the funds in these vulnerable smart contracts, and after the smart contracts were fixed, uh, the good guys uh, gave back all the eaters. Um, I didn't mention so far, but uh, there are shared libraries in the blockchain as well. And uh, this is uh, because of two reasons. First of all, by using shared libraries, you can save gas, which means uh, everything is cheaper. Uh, and now that you share code, uh, which is usually nice, uh, but now you also share vulnerabilities if there is a vulnerability in a shared library. And uh, in this case, uh, the multi-signature valets from Parity uh, were hacked. So uh, the first part uh, of um, these uh, smart contract uh, is uh, there. It's not very important uh, how this works uh, from the hacking side. It's just uh, important to see how you can reach this code. Uh, this code, what I'm going to show you, is not the shared library code, but uh, this is basically a template uh, for your multi-signature wallet. Uh, the first row, uh, function payable, uh, this is a special syntax uh, for a function call, uh, which will be executed every time when someone calls a function in your smart contract which does not ex exist. So it's like a, a try-catch or a statement or something like that when uh, the smart contract has no idea how to deal with this code. And uh, whenever there was no ether sent uh, with uh, the transaction, but uh, some data was sent, in that case, uh, the shared uh, library was called with a delegate call. And this delegate call function is uh, very special uh, because uh, this means that uh, the function call uh, will be passed to, to the library code, but it will run in the context of the original smart contract. And the issue with the shared library was that uh, it had uh, the init wallet function, and uh, this init wallet function was even public, which meant uh, attacker was able to call the init wallet function in the original smart contract because the init wallet was not implemented in the original smart contract it was passed to the shared library and the shared library executed the init wallet but in the context of the real uh, smart contract which meant the attacker was able to initialize, re initialize the smart contract in his name, which means that now, from now on, he was the owner of the smart contract. So he was able to control all the ether which was stored in the smart contract. So he was able to just transfer all the ether stored in this multi-signature values and uh, send it to himself. All right, so you might think, 
okay, uh, Ethereum is still in kind of a beta phase and a lot of people are jumping into coding smart contracts. So it happens from time to time that uh, random guys have no idea how to code smart contracts. But the funny thing is that, for example, uh, this uh, wallet code and uh, the parity shared library, the main developer uh, of that smart contract was uh, Gavin Wood, uh, who is basically the main uh, developer of uh, the Solidity language itself. So yeah, smart contracts are hard, I would say. Uh, but uh, people realized, okay, we lost a lot of money in the smart contracts, uh, but uh, luckily the good guys were able to secure uh, some of the uh, the remaining smart contracts. So uh, were these uh, not on fire? I, I'm hearing some echo or noise or whatever. So uh, they fixed uh, the bug, and by fixing this bug, they introduced a new bug. And uh, what uh, they did is that when they published uh, the new shared library, the blockchain, they uh, forgot to initialize uh, the wallet, and uh, on. The 3rd of August, uh, someone commented about this, that this can be an issue and uh, it has to be solved. And uh, in November, uh, the next hack happened when uh, 300 million US dollars worth of Ethereum was lost because uh, this shared library was not initialized. And uh, someone called uh, DevOps9911 uh, accidentally, accidentally called the init wallet function uh, on the shared library. And after that, he accidentally called the kill method uh, on the shared library, which killed this shared library, which means uh, all the smart contracts which were relying on this new enhanced and fixed and secure smart contract, they got, they are not usable anymore. There was a vote uh, about this, uh, whether uh, they will fix this the same way they fixed the DAO attack, uh, doing any soft forks or hard forks. But at the end of the day, the people voted that they will just leave this as it is. So these uh, 300 million worth uh, of eaters uh, are basically lost forever, at least for now. So they are trapped in the blockchain and no one can access those. Uh, there are very uh, important differences in the first and the second parity hack and although both of them involve the shared libraries the way the hack happened is totally different because uh, in the first hack uh, you had to uh, call functions on uh, every uh, vulnerable smart contract in order to steal the money but in the second hack uh, there was only a single call in the shared library to initialize it uh, and taking ownership of it. And there was another call to kill it and this killed all the smart contract which relied on it. And as I already mentioned, this was already a known bug with the shared library that it is not initialized, but uh, people misdiagnosed the risk. They had no idea how, uh, risky this is there was a plan to fix it but turned out that uh, life comes faster all right let's 
have a quick talk about uh, interior. Let's say you store uh, the number of people on the bus on an unsigned integer on eight bytes. And let's say that there are three people on the bus. And what happens if uh, four of these people uh, took off the bus? How many people are still on the bus? Right? That's, that's the question. And the answer is that uh, in the smart contract and solidity world, it is uh, 255 people are on the bus right now, right? And the same goes with the overflow that uh, if you store the number of people on the bus on a downside integer and the bus is already full and one guy hops on the bus, in the case, bus and the totally what you expect from basic math, right? Cool. Now, it turned out that uh, there was a scam smart contract, uh, which uh, was basically scammed <laughs> uh, by these uh, integer under flow attack. Uh, the POWH uh, stands for proof of weak hands. And uh, this is a scam scheme uh, for a smart contract. What is really fascinating about these uh, scam smart contracts is that they live in the blockchain forever. So it's not like they are gonna disappear anytime because they are in the blockchain. And I, I find this really fascinating that you can run a scam in the blockchain forever. Uh, I really don't want to go into the details how this proof of fake hands works. Uh, if you want, uh, you can check it. It's basically the smart contract implementation of the pump and dump scheme. When you invest money in something, then you start to market it, that it will go up and people will uh, invest money in it. Then you sell out of the product and something like that. It's a bit more complicated than that, but uh, this, this is the basic idea. And uh, turned out uh, there was an integer underflow issue with this smart contract. So the attacker was able to get all uh, the ether stored in this uh, scam contract. So this is how scammers get scammed in the smart contract world. So what is the conclusion of this? Writing secure smart contracts is hard. I think Ethereum is still in beta and uh, hacking smart contracts is possible on, but probably it is illegal unless you are hacking your own smart contracts, but uh, I'm not really sure about this, but uh, I'm sh definitely sure that hacking in the test blockchain is not illegal. Uh, if you want to learn how smart contracts work or how the Solidity language works, I highly recommend you to visit the CryptoZombies.io website. They have very nice interactive tutorials for beginners, how they can start uh, designing and implementing smart contracts. By far the best place to start with smart contract. And uh, if you are already very familiar with uh, the Solidity language and how smart contracts can be hacked, I recommend you to visit the Ethernet uh, CTF site where you can uh, hack vulnerable smart contracts on the test blockchain. And it is very fun and uh, these are basically real world examples how you can hack smart contracts and uh, you are interacting with the smart contracts as you would interact with them in the real world. So this is an awesome place to learn hacking uh, smart contracts. Uh, here are some of the references I used uh, in my slides. Uh, I want to also recommend you if you are interested in the latest hypes and scams of the 
cryptocurrency world, then you should definitely visit uh, 4chan uh, Beast channel. There is uh, all the good stuff when it comes to scams. So that's all, guys. Uh, that's all what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I really hope uh, that uh, I was able to explain uh, things uh, regarding the smart contract world and uh, now you know more about this. Uh, if you want, uh, you can ask questions. I am not 100% sure I will be able to answer the questions, but let's try this and let's hope for the best. Thank you for your attention.